Good morning, Secretary Carter, General Allen, senior leaders of the department, civilian and military, Medal of Honor recipients, and especially Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, his family and friends, it's an honor to be with you. Our admiration for Lieutenant Colonel Kettles comes from his acts of heroism, but also from his quiet professionalism. From how on the day of his greatest testing, just as with all other days, he embodied the Army's values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. But I need to be honest up front. Behind my appreciation for Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, there's also some home state pride. He's a fellow Michigander. So when I heard that Lieutenant Colonel Kettles and his family drove themselves here to Washington and in a vehicle that he custom designed for his beloved wife, Anne, and when I heard later that he asked the Secret Service if he could wheel right up to the White House for yesterday's ceremony, I thought to myself, that's pure Michigan. <laughs> and we've seen this Midwestern And we've seen this Midwestern manner of humility and humor throughout this process, starting when we first reached out to him. When we asked how he'd like to be addressed, he said, you can call me anything you'd like, just don't call me late for dinner. Eight of Chuck and Ann's 10 children are here today, and I want to thank them for being with us and for not laughing or laughing at the lines you've probably heard 100 times. If you grow up in Michigan, chances are you've spent some time with machines. For Chuck Kettles, that meant a love affair with engines and aviation from the very start of his life. From his education at Edison Institute in Dearborn, where he practiced on a flight simulator, to his work with cars and engines at his Ford dealership, we see some of what prepared him to be an Army aviator. The Huey that Chuck flew was pioneering, a pioneering machine at the time, but he knew instinctively how to get the most out of it. So while the deeds we honor today were the product of great courage and valor, they had the roots in what he learned growing up in Michigan. Chuck was highly skilled and well prepared to fly into danger, but what he achieved on May 15, 1967 was not predestined. His heroic actions were the result of individual, individual decisions he made on that day and every day he served as an Army officer, from the very day he volunteered to serve in Vietnam. Ultimately, it was because Chuck decided, not once, not two or three times, but on four separate occasions to fly directly into enemy fire that 44 American lives survived. Each time, he knew it would be more dangerous, yet each time, he made the same decision. Chuck had never met most of the soldiers he was rescuing. He had no idea about their backgrounds, their race, who they loved, or where they went to pray. All he knew was that they were his fellow soldiers, that they were fellow Americans. At the back of his mind, he must also have understood that for these young men to see their parents again, to embrace their loved ones again, to serve their country again, it all depended upon him and his crew and the decisions he would make that day. A couple of months ago, Chuck went out to dinner when a man approached him. He pointed to a table where his children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, 14 people in all had gathered. And he said to Chuck, you see those folks over there? It's all your fault. <laughs> it was an extended family of one of the dozens of men Chuck and his crew had rescued. Over the past two days, the President, the Department of Defense, and the Army have celebrated Chuck's heroic actions. But we still have no way to appreciate them in their totality, because we have no way to calculate the contributions of those Chuck rescued, of the families they raised, or all of the people they inspired. We do know, however, that many of the soldiers Chuck served alongside endured a painful homecoming. For some, their service was little regarded. For others, they were shunned by friends and loved ones because of it. Their experience should weigh on all of us, and it must never be repeated. In the United States, we pride ourselves on the free exchange of ideas, and robust debate about our nation's security is essential. But we must not conflate our views of war with our views of our warfighters. As President Obama has said, we must show all who have worn the uniform the respect and dignity they deserve. In learning about his heroic, this heroic soldier from Ypsilanti, we've seen patience, 
humility, and duty redefined. In hearing the stories of many of his brothers, members of the team to which he was so devoted, we've seen what we value most as an army. For his part, Chuck decide, describes his deeds humbly. He volunteered for Vietnam, he has said, because there was a need and I had the skills. He felt a duty to contribute because it was the right thing to do. Long after he left Vietnam, he's carried those commitments forward. The technical skills that helped save so many lives in Vietnam, he shared with generations of students in Michigan. To this day, he visits local high schools to answer questions about a war those students never knew. Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Kettles was the consummate Army officer, but across his life, he's also served as the best kind of teacher, one who instructs through his actions, through his patience, and his humble example. Yesterday and today, we've had the chance to bestow a long overdue honor, but we've also had the opportunity to recall some overdue lessons as a country. We've had the chance to put the courage and valor of Chuck Kettles at the center of how we understand our history, our country, and the citizens who serve it so proudly. For that and so much more, Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, you have our deepest admiration as an army. You have our deepest appreciation as a nation. Thank you.